Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the U.S. Naval Institute. Today is Friday, the 17th of March. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Glad to have you all on board. Uh, this show today, we're going to be doing uh, part two of the discussion of the D.A.R.E. workshop. So we had part one last Friday, which was the 10th of March. So if you haven't listened to that episode or watched that episode, you can go back and watch it. Uh, the D.A.R.E. Um, workshop is something that we do every year. It's concurrent with our big West Conference, the AFCEA Naval Institute West Conference at the uh, uh, San Diego Convention Center. While that's happening down on the convention floor with all the speakers and panels and, and everything going on. Um, we have this group of junior officers, mid to senior grade enlisted folks, uh, Navy, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, and some civilians. Uh, and they are doing this thing called design thinking where they take two, it's usually two questions posed by one of the sea service chiefs. So the Commandant of the Marine Corps, Commandant of the Coast Guard, and the CNO rotate every year. So this year, 2023, it was CNO Gilday's chance to ask the D.A.R.E. Wor workshop to tackle a couple of questions that had been particularly perplexing, some would say wicked problems, to him as the CNO. So last week we talked with the, uh, a couple of the representatives from the Force Design Workshop, and this week we're going to talk to a couple members of the Talent Management Workshop. So uh, let's bring our guests into the studio here. I want to introduce uh, YNC, so uh, Yeoman Chief Petty Officer Tanisha Smith, and uh, Major Chris Davis, U.S. Marine Corps. He is a JAG officer, J Judge Advocate General Officer. And back uh, for the second week in a row is Lieutenant Commander Steve Hulse, U.S. Coast Guard, and he is the Federal Executive Fellow assigned from the Coast Guard to the Naval Institute uh, for this year. And Steve was instrumental in recruiting the talent for the uh, D.A.R.E. workshop and uh, for putting it on and for massaging the questions with the CNO's office and the, the, uh, the outbrief that will happen afterwards or did happen. And then it'll be turned into a proceedings article. A lot of work goes into this thing um, uh, every year. And if somebody, if you're, if you have in mind a question, like, why is it called D.A.R.E.? Well, we take that from the Naval Institute motto, which is dare to read, think, speak, and write. So we use dare, dare workshop uh, every year. So anyway, Tanisha, Chris, Steve, welcome to the show. It's great to have you on board. Um, give me a little bit, Tanisha, where are you calling in from today? Um, Mr. Hamlet, I'm calling in from San Diego, California. And, and what's your current command? So my current command is... Um, Com VRM wing. It's the uh, Osprey community um, wing, the the ISIC for all the squadrons in the Osprey community. Right, that's that's the Navy's new newly established just in the last couple of years the uh, the COD replacement for carrier onboard delivery. Uh, so the the um, the the C two Greyhound's gone or is going away, and the MV twenty two or CMV twenty two Osprey taking the place. So that's very cool. Uh, and uh, Major Davis, where are, you, where are you beaming in from today? Sir, I'm just south of Washington, D.C. in Alexandria, Virginia. Alexandria, Virginia. Okay, not too far away. And Steve, you're uh, at your house in the Annapolis area? Yes, Bill, that's correct. And I'll, uh, I'll reiterate, uh, before joining the Naval Institute team for this year, uh, Steve was commanding officer of a fast response cutter, U.S. Coast Guard, uh, out in Bahrain, so part of the Pat Four Southwest Asia uh, group of ships uh, out doing God and Country's work out there in uh, in the Bahrain Persian Gulf area. So, uh, well, welcome all to the sh to the show. Uh, first, for Tanisha and Chris, just uh, quickly, how did you hear about the Dare Workshop? Um, how did it come to you know across your radar, and and um, uh, you know how did you uh, decide to to participate in it? Uh, start with well, uh, Tanisha. Yeah, <laughs> I guess ahead. I can start. Um, so I believe it came down from um, our force uh, master chief down to the command master chiefs at the different commands. Um, and the information was basically put out um, um, that they were looking for members to um, address some issues within the service to attract, retain, um, and recruit uh, sailors into the Navy so we could uh, – you know, build our force up. 
And so um, the email came out and they asked us for like, a, it was like a statement application thing to, to see where, where we thought we could um, bring ideas to improve the situation. And so I submitted my, my application and chain of command was all for it. Awesome. How about you, Chris? So I would say at the beginning of COVID, a lot of us during our downtime kind of created a, a little bit of a network online through various social media uh, venues, whether that's LinkedIn or Instagram, uh, of military leaders. And we, we share and talk and discuss and tag each other in a bunch of ideas through that network over the last couple of years, which has grown quite large and impactful, in my opinion, um, to the point that you know last year, Lieutenant General Bellin uh, who is the Mar 4 Res, Mar 4 South Commanding General, invited a handful of the group to be his official visitors for the 8th and I uh, Sunset Parade. Uh, one of those individuals is a past participant in the D.A.R.E. workshop, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Brian Kirk. He forwarded me yeah. the announcement that went out this past year. And given some things that I have published in the past, specifically about uh, retaining and uh, recruiting Top, to, top tier leaders and, uh, and and holding on to leaders in the in the service, uh, he thought that I would be uniquely uh, situated to participate. So I, I I had my I got the information directly from a past participant and then applied directly to the institute. Cool. And uh, I'll mention, and I know a lot of our listeners are aware that uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Kirg is a member of our editorial board. He's also, he writes for proceedings quite often, and he was the proceedings author of the year, I want to say in 2021, but I don't quote me on that, but it was in the, in the past couple of years, Brian Kirk was our author of the year, and he's prolific and just a great guy. So good, good to hear that connection. Um, so uh, first off, I'm, I'm, Chris, if you would just uh, tell the listeners what the question was that the CNO asked your group to address. Right. So I don't have the, uh, the the specific question in front of me. I, I'll, I can chalk that over to Lieutenant Colonel, uh, Lieutenant Commander Hulse if he if he wants. But generally speaking, it was what are those obstacles or things that are preventing the service from retaining the the best possible leaders, retaining talent within the force going forward. Okay. And, uh, Good. Chris, I, I can add to that the specific questions um, kind of underneath that overview that. Um, CNO had asked where if you were a coach, teacher, guidance counselor, religious leader, or parent, what would you value most in recommending a career? What should the Navy do to make those recommendations easier? In your organization, what is the leading cause of you or your peers' choice to leave? What are the leading reasons for them to stay? How does your organization help people improve, adjust, or even evolve in their organizational role to feel valued by and remain invested in the organization? And finally, resilience and inclusion are anchors to positive culture and help ensure those we lead can overcome obstacles. How does the Navy better foster resiliency and inclusion? So that's a mouthful. Uh, obviously, you know, the, the main thrust is get good people in, keep them in, keep them challenged uh, and, and retain the very best ones. Right. It reminds me that in the November issue of Proceedings, we had uh, the fourth year in a row that General Berger, the Commandant of the Marine Corps, wrote for uh, the Marine Corps issue. And uh, this past November, his article was about recruiting and retention. It was about, and, and, and he included some comments about the importance of the services being able to influence the people who influence the decisions of young people, right? So you, Steve, when you read the, the CNO's question there, it included things like coaches and teachers and, you know, priests and, and uh, you know, religious leaders and parents, right? It's, so it's not just about uh, um, getting in front of, you know, 18 and 19 year olds to influence them, but it's also about getting the, the message about what the, the military, the sea services provide in terms of opportunity uh, and service to the nation in front of the people who are gonna influence their decisions or, or who can support those decisions. So um, one of the things that I, I think is very exciting and I've watched the debriefs now for a number of these DARE workshops is watching um, the, the sea service chief get to have a briefing directly from 
in your case, uh, you know, Tanisha was a, a chief petty officer and, and you, Chris. Um, and so, you know, they, when you work in the Pentagon, you know, if you're a lieutenant commander or commander or captain, you might have a chance to brief a sea service chief. But in this case, the DARE workshop, it, we cut out all those middlemen, right? This doesn't go up through 19 layers of chain, chains of command before the CNO hears it. And CNO Gildia even said how refreshing it was. I, I'm not, I'm paraphrasing him, but he said something about how refreshing it was to get an answer sort of unfiltered from, from you all. Um, Tanisha, I want to just ask you, uh, what was the aspect of the question or the, you know, the, uh, the brief back that you addressed to CNO, uh, you know, and what were, what were some of those uh, main points that you made to him? So a lot of the focus um, was how do we, um, who are the most influential people in, in the youth today that we're trying to um, recruit or attract to come into the military and where do they get their influence from? And, and we started with, you know, like there's, your, there's family, there's teachers, there's counselors, like the question implied. And it's like, how do we what can we do to get them? What is attracted to them? For me, um, if if I'm a parent, which I am, and, and I want my, my child to go into the military, what could you tell me about the military that's going to make me say, yes, this is, a, this is something that I want my child to be a part of the organization? And um, for me, I just gave him my personal experiences as a, as a mom um, and as a mom of five and as a single mom of five. Um, wow. I've been in the Navy now for, uh, yeah, <laughs> I've been in the Navy now for 23 years and, um, I'm grateful for the opportunities that have come my way and, and no, it wasn't easy, but, um, the Navy has given me so much benefit that, um, I knew this where I wanted to be and where I needed to be. It helped me develop not only as a sailor, but as a woman and as a mother. And, and now as a wife. Um, so I think that just showing um, or just letting CNO know that they're, the, the stories and the recruitment needs to come from the, the warriors and the sailors and the Marines that are already serving, that are, are positive, that, are, that have great experiences and that can give um, input into real situations and real stories and not just from a recruitment and numbers standpoint. So like for me, um, there are a lot of young sailors in the military. And when I say young, I'm, I mean young as in service years um, that come in and they're like, well, how can I start a family and be in the Navy? It's going to be too hard and, and that sort of thing. And when I tell them, you know, it's not easy, but you can do it. I did it with five and I did it by myself um, in the sense of in the home, but in throughout the military, there were other sailors, other chiefs, other first class petty officers that helped me along the way. And those are the stories that we need to share with people who are trying to come in to know that you can have a family in the military, you can get the help that you need, and you can have a very promising and successful career um, and, and still live a what we would call a normal life. All right, good points. Um, so you mentioned you know, you've been in for 23 years. Your mom of five. How old is your oldest child? My oldest now is 21. OK. And uh, is, is he or she thinking about military service or already in, perhaps? <laughs> she is not thinking of military service. She does. Okay. She is married and she has a military spouse. <laughs> OK, there you go. Um, yep. But they she um out of all of the children of course has grown with me throughout my career and so um she understands the sacrifices but her experiences with me um and as she shares it with other kids at her school like you know i grew up in japan i i i got to try different cultures and do different things and and those aspects too when you you worry as a sailor like is this conducive, um, this environment of, you know, trying to uproot and start over again, is that work for, for kids? But as kids are resilient and they're as, and they're as resilient as, as you, um, they see the energy and the spirit in you. So if you're continuing to 
be uh, positive with them and explain the experiences and, and let them share in your journey with you, then they'll grow up to be just as productive as a child that grew up in their hometown for 17 years and went through school with all their friends. And so um, my oldest is 21. My youngest is nine. Um, uh, and I'm about to be a grandmother. And um, th my career has affected my kids in, in so many great ways. Um, and sometimes we've had some crazy experiences. But for the most part, um, the Navy has been the foundation for me. Um, and there was a point in my career in 2006 when I was at my eight-year mark um, that I got out of the military because my mom was diagnosed with cancer. Mm. But I had great leadership who guided me through the process. And I ended up doing the reserves for five years. And once I was established and ready to go back, um, I got endorsed by Admiral Harris. And I came right back in in 2012, back on active duty. And I kept my time in service. I kept my rank. Um, and I was able to still be eligible for promotion to chief petty officer. So there are great opportunities um, out there. And I just really want other, um, especially young women who believe that, you know, you can't have a family in the military, that you can do it. Yeah. And, and your experience there of getting out and going into the reserves and then coming back in reminds me of uh, a comment that in, in an interview that we published, it was, wasn't a, a, a video or an uh, audio interview. It was the interview that we published, Vice Admiral John Mustin, who's the chief of the Navy Reserve, uh, it was in the February issue of Proceedings. One of the things that he mentioned about uh, the reserves that they've been um, focusing on is this career flexibility, the ability to do what you did, right? To, to move laterally into the reserves and then move laterally back into the active duty force, right? So career intermission, some of that career flexibility that perhaps is new, uh, from when I, you know, was a, a junior officer, th that kind of flexibility was much more difficult. But now the Navy and the Reserves and the Marine Corps are, are I think, becoming much more flexible organizations to, to allow people to do that kind of thing. So I, I, I applaud that. That's a great point. Um, so Major Davis, uh, what are some other things that came out of the working group, the specific recommendations that you guys made to CNO, perhaps some that he nodded to and perhaps some that he, you know, wasn't so sure about. Well, if I may, sir, I want to circle back on a few things that Tanisha said that I think were critically important for what came out of our group. The, the first thing that we sh not struggled with, but that the design thinking process allowed us to do was properly frame the problem, the problem that the CNO had given us. And one of the things we quickly realized were, you know, the, the abstract question of, you know, what is it going to take to retain somebody in the service? First of all, the, the motivations that people have for joining, Tanisha just gave you one of how she joined and two for why she got out and three, why she decided to come back in. Um, they're going to be different for each people. And so how you address shaping the force, retaining those top, that, 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 that talent management piece is going to be different and we for each person. And we, in our group, I think we had narrowed it down to about three or four primary motivations for why someone joins the service. And, and I think generally speaking, Tanisha, please correct me if I'm, if, I, if I'm misstating it, but some are just joining because it's, it's, it's a family tradition. So there's like a lineage legacy aspect. Um, there was the aspect of maybe a stepping stone. This is a this is something that's going to give me a skill that makes me more competitive in the future. Maybe some, and as a Marine, I know this resonates with me and a, a lot of my peers, a sense of adventure, a sense of let me go prove myself in the world, especially at a time where the last two decades we were fighting multiple wars, right? Or one war on multiple battlefields. Um and then, quite frankly, you have somebody that joins because they're seeking something, they're seeking a purpose, they're seeking a mission in life, and they're not sure what that is. But, you know, there's that light on in that office at the Armed Forces Center, and it never turns off, and that recruiter is always there, and I'm going to just go in and see what I can find out, what information is there. So each of those people, to keep them in, it's going to take a different solution set. So, you know, what Team Nation just hit on, I think is critically important. One of the things our group really we didn't we didn't struggle with this i'm not I'm, i'll be honest we had a, a group of pretty smart individuals 
we and we understand the reality of the, the problem for the CNO, the Navy and the Marine Corps are not trying to retain everybody. They're just not. We need the influx influxion of new folks with some regularity. Well, what we focused on in our group was we're trying to retain the right people. And the right people, and we tried to define this and we really struggled with actually narrowing down a, a, a concrete definition with any kind of granularity. But generally speaking, what we came up with is what Tanisha just said. What was influencing her and what shaped her career to both get out temporarily, join the reserves and get back in was good leadership. So we have to retain the right people. Now, what does the right people look like in the year 2023? Well, the, I think I said that right, 2023. Um, career flexibility is a big thing for our generation. And career flexibility isn't just the idea that we can do a few different things and plug and play your Olive Garden pick to dinner with your different dessert. Like, no, 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 no. It's not a, it's not a prescribed menu, right? It means that the service member owns their career. The service member who is selflessly serving and giving up a lot of the other uh, decisions in their life, where they're going to go, what they're going to do, how they're going to do this, how many holidays they miss, you know, are they going to be around for their children? Like, all those things, we give up so much. The one thing we want to do is be able to control this little aspect of our career. And, and that's a super uncomfortable thing for the service chiefs, for the CNO, because they have a responsibility to Congress. It's a statutory requirement to have a force that they know what it looks like prepared to fight the nation's wars and to keep the nation safe. So we understand that that's a tough, tough problem. And that's why you guys invited out only, you know, the most intelligent and most, you know, uh, well-versed individuals to kind of tackle this tough problem that many folks in the Beltway are trying to uh, answer. And one of the one of the things that we found, and, and I not to take uh, Tanisha's the, a lot of the efforts that she was instrumental on, is we we realized that we need to meet the service member where they're currently at, and where they're currently at is not sitting necessarily in front of their TV watching family. Uh, TV shows at night after dinner. They're not necessarily sitting there at the, the, the city park, getting some out, outdoor time away from, no, they're on their phones. They're on their devices. They're in the information space. And so the battlefield per se um, of mm -hmm. where we need to meet the service member, the battle space that the service chiefs and the services must win is right here, is right here. And it's in the information that pe people are consuming. And so we're doing ourselves a disservice by not telling the stories of, stories of people like Tanisha Smith and not filling in the granularity of how a person can be remarkably successful in our organization through a very, you know, I'm not to put words in your mouth, Tanisha, I'm not saying that you're not a, a, a traditional career path, but getting out and getting back in and being successful is not what they market to you on the brochure. So I don't think she's offended and we, we became good friends in, in San Diego, but she has a very untraditional path. I did not join to be a judge advocate. The Marine Corps sent me to law school in 2015. So my path has been remarkably untraditional too. Mm. My story can be told and probably advocate and, and bring in the right people. So to answer your question, sir, in a long roundabout way, we really spent a lot of time. And I think that's what the design thinking process was good at. We tried to properly frame the problem and what that problem entailed. And then we had to create our own definitions and metrics of, of what success looks like. And what we kept coming back to for us is what are those things that are going to retain leaders, leaders in our service who are going to positively infect, impact what the force looks like next. And, and what that looked like for us is folks that have initiative and drive and the people that we want, they want ownership over their career. They want to feel like they have a say. We understood that's uncomfortable for the services, but if you want to retain, you know, it, what is the uh, the adage? Uh, if you love something, let it go. And if it comes back, like that's what we're talking about here, giving up a little bit of that strength and power um, and that chokehold on people's careers. And you might be surprised. You might be able to keep a, you know, a Tanisha Smith for 23 years in the Navy, which is a value add to all of us. Uh, that's a really good point. And, and I know one of the things that General Berger wrote about in his article back in November was that, the, the arguments and the tools to reach people and to bring them in and then to keep them are different for this generation than they were for his or for you know the 
millennials, for example, right? It's, you know, the, the Gen Z, it's, it's going to be different. And, and, you know, some people will say, ah, they're just snowflakes and they, you know, no, it's not. It, it, there's always generational differences from every group that has ever served. It, 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 the, the next generation is going to be different. They're going to think and see the world differently because the world has changed and, uh, and, and you got to meet them where they are. And I hear that from what you're saying. Sir, just to piggyback, you and I had a conversation immediately after the data workshop ended, and I think that one of the things that the services have to recognize is your generation did not have LinkedIn. And so LinkedIn is not my preferred social 100%. media platform, but what LinkedIn does for all of the services and all the service members is I no longer have uncertainty in my decision to get out of the military, right? Like I now know what it, I know my worth. I know my value to the civilian workforce. And I know that because I can see what my peers who have similar qualifications and similar li lived experiences and life experiences to me, what they're being paid and what they're doing and where they're living and how they're living their lives. So what might have scared somebody into staying in for 20, because let's be honest, a pension at 41, 42, 44, 45 years old, GI Bill benefit, those are great perks. Life is not bad as a military service member. You get a lot of things, and that was one of the, you know, the recommendations that came out of our group, show people what their, what, the, what their actual compensation is in a meaningful way. Like, what is your pay? What is your BAH? What are your medical benefits? What is all this? Look, what would it take for you to maintain your standard of living in the civilian world? Because I don't think most service members actually understand and appreciate that. So our argument was never that life isn't good necessarily in the military. Sure, you have a few bad days, but who doesn't? I mean, that's 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 life in general. Our argument um, necessarily was now if I'm having enough bad days in a row and I'm considering making the massive career change to take the uniform off, something that most of us don't really want to do. I love being in the Marine Corps. It's the only thing I've ever been good at in my entire life. But on LinkedIn, I now know what my, I know what my worth is to another organization that might allow me to have less bad days in a row. That, that's a very interesting point. I do remember that conversation. And, and I'll tell you that when I was an ensign and I was serving in a, as the intelligence officer in a, a, a strike fighter squadron way back when, um, you know, my peers, one, when I graduated from the Naval Academy, you know, and we shotgunned out to the fleet, I lost track of all my classmates until at least the five year, you know, come back and have a reunion point, right? So I couldn't compare notes with most of my classmates because we sort of lost touch with each other. We're shotgunned out to the world. You guys at your generation, you don't, right? So that's one point. Um, and the second point is in, in my generation, the folks who knew what they were worth were the pilots because they knew other pilots who got out and went to fly for the airlines, right? And they knew exactly, you know, this is the airline pay schedule. This is what you're going to make in year one, year two, year three. And by year five, you're, you're ahead of where you were. So pilots had that information, but most others did not have that information. The other one, the other group that did was, was the nukes who wanted to go into civilian nuclear power because that was a pretty well-known, okay, you know, there's electric companies around the world, around the country that run nuclear power plants and they hire former Navy nukes to run those plants. And so they, that was pretty well understood, but you, you make a really good point there. Um, okay, so now I thank you for sort of segueing me back around that question I did ask you. So I'll, I'll throw it to Tanisha now. What were some things when you briefed CNO that you saw his head kind of go like this? And what were some things that maybe he asked questions about or, or seemed to have doubts about? So I, I will say the uh, we re recommended like a road show, right? Where where people high, you know, at different levels in the in the military could go out and and recruit, but not to recruit necessarily for numbers to put a check in a box, but to really bring the experience out. And I and I could see his his head kind of going like, okay, this might work. Um, it would entail some, um, you know, some, some moving, a lot of like little moving pieces, right? Which I, which I loved about the design thinking process because it allowed us as we were going through the steps to come up with the ideas without the constraints, 
right? So when you can come up with the ideas and plan for the ideas and limit the constraints, then that that brings out more of, you know, possibilities, um, even if they may not, even if they seem impossible is what I'm what I'm trying to get at. And then um, I don't know. I think he liked I'm, I'm just being I'm tooting our own horn, but I think he liked the talent management's ideas. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I didn't think he shook his head too much about um, anything that we brought up. Would it probably be a challenge to do? Um, yes. Is it possible? Yes. You know, um, I think with the right team of people, um, it's, it's it, having a roadshow to go around to different states and give that information experiences life what it really is like in the military um from the big from from your lower ranks all the way up to your higher ranks and and really give that positive experience because let's face it you know um a lot of the things we see on the front of some of these newspapers regarding military service members are not always in a positive light they're quick to throw out the negative but we don't get to see those positive um, influences that are actually happening out there more so than the um, than the negative things. And so it would be nice to have like a team, almost like the Blue Angels, but for recruitment that would mm -hmm. actually get that information and, and have those discussions, those one on one discussions with the community, with churches, with schools, with um, with parents and not in a recruiter i'm going to tell you whatever i want to tell you just so you will you will sign separate, on the dotted separate, line separate from people who are on actual recruiting duty and correct chris you got your, chris, you got your hand up so so uh, what i was going to say is tanisha can you tell that little anecdote that you had and i thought i thought it was if memory serves me your son but maybe maybe it wasn't mm -hmm. but about how little information that he knew about the military and his mom was in the <laughs> is in the movie. So I, think yeah. the, I think the anecdote highlights something that the reason the roadshow was one of the proposals that our group had, it's not a recruiting effort, like Tanisha said. It's an information operation campaign where society recognizably and measurably, the civil military divide is widening. And so we're losing that information campaign that occurs at the dinner table, that occurs, mm -hmm. you know, in, in, at, in the high school gym, that occurs in the church. And occurs. So, Tanisha, if you don't mind, I think that that story actually add some granularity to like the reason that we came up with the road show. Sure. So I have a stepson. Um, so my husband is also active duty military. He's a command master chief. Uh, I have a 21 year old stepson. So he's getting it on both ends from, from, from bonus mom and dad. Right. And we're like, pew, pew, shooting him with all the information. Right. Um, but I think still in his mind, he didn't, the, the kids, they're kind of like here, they kind of live in the military bubble. Right. So they don't really, they don't experience the outside world like like um, it's kind of like we have our own little community. And so I sure. think he kind of grew up in that bubble and he he saw us get up and put the uniform on and go to work. But he it didn't really set into his mind. Um, but now that he's in, he is he is active now. He is a, a CS. Um, he's an ama he's amazing. He loves his job. And he, now seeing both myself and his father in uniform has a total different impact on him than it did before he came in. But now when he has questions, they filter through the both of us. And so he gets his dad's perspective from a command master chief and he gets his stepmom's perspective from a chief because my perspective from my husband's perspective is different because we work on different levels. And so sure. he gets that perspective from both of us. And I, and I think it adds to his desire to want to be in. And then my husband just told me last night that my bonus daughter is actually going to join the Navy as well. So we got to have two in the family. So I'm super excited. That's Did awesome. she want to join the Marine Corps, Tanisha? I can talk to her. We can. <laughs> uh -uh. <laughs> Coast Guard's hiring too. <laughs> we did learn that the Coast Guard is hiring. Yes, we yeah. did. So um, I'm going to ask uh, Steve, you were sort of a, you know, helped to organize this thing and then an outside observer watching both the force design and the talent management group. Um, you know, any insights from your perspective or thoughts on the, you know, the ideas that they came up with or, or watching how they went through the, the, um, the design thinking process? I thought what was really interesting about each group is they all tackled the, um, 
you know, the, the problem differently. I thought that was really interesting. Each group came up with uh, wildly different ideas uh, where I was almost expecting a lot of the ideas to be the same. And um, from each group, there was one presenter and then they worked together for the presentation. And, um, and I thought that that was really unique. It really added a lot to the presentation to have all of those different ideas and perspectives. Um, and I would say that during the actual presentation to CNO, there was one idea that, that did go out that I feel like maybe he didn't receive, CNO didn't receive as well or um, didn't really have time to process it. But I thought it was a really good idea. And that was to end um, enlistments, enlistment contracts, and to allow folks after an initial um, after an initial enlistment to just serve the same way in the enlisted workforce as they do in the officer workforce, where you're just on an extended contract and, and you could uh, come and go as, as you as you please, so to speak. And um, if if either uh, Tanisha or Chris wants to expand on that point, I thought that was a really interesting point um, that maybe CNO didn't really jump on as much. But I'll, I'll, I'll kick it over to Chris or Tanisha. Yeah, to be fair to the CNO, um, that we had planned for about 10 or 12 minutes to brief that particular point because it went back to like the crux of our career flexibility and ownership piece. Um, and I think we had about 42 seconds to brief. And so basically the only thing CNO heard was, yeah, we think you should end enlistments, re-enlistments. And he's like, whoa. Um, and his aides like, you know, tapping the watch saying we got to go. And it's like, we're trying to like pull it in like a vaudeville show uh, on, on the big, on the headline that we sold, but really kind of, you know, there was a lot to bear down on uh, for the reason we were trying to give him that headline, that show stopping uh, statement. But again, our group focused on retaining the right people and the right people want to own their career path, whatever that career path is. And it's going to be unique to that person defined by maybe what their motivations were for joining and motivations are for staying in the service. So we said end reenlistments, period. Now, what do you do is almost, almost all large civilian corporations, they have some type of human resource management role. So the first thing we, we or human resource management team. So the first thing we asked or we would have posed to the CNO if we had an additional time was, Admiral Gilday, has the military commensurate to the civilian population since we argued 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, maybe 80s time frame? Um, I'm thinking of like Harvard Business Review type books and writings of, of, in literature. Has the service invested comparatively or commensurately the amount of resources into human resourcing as the civilian world has done? Because the civilian world has done a tremendous job as an outsider, but at least, you know, there is a large effort where they hire experts in these large corporations to just understand the dynamic of the human resourcing piece. So that was the first thing. So we need to, we probably need to divest to invest sort of, you know, to use the commandant's uh, vernacular in just the human resourcing aspect. And we defined human resourcing as anybody that touches the service member at any one of those sort of decision points. So sure, monitors, um, monitors, detailers, those count. Recruiters might count. Career counselors might count. Is that comparative and do we have enough resourcing uh, behind that effort? So that was the first thing. Now, the second thing is once we understand that piece, which is a critical understanding of gathering information piece, Ending reenlistments might sound like a very nervous or risky proposition for the CNO, and I would argue it probably it still is. Um, but if you understand the human resourcing piece and you understand where your people are and are a little bit better of what their motivations are, because people are having conversations with these people and regularly understanding who the individual is beyond just the number on the brief sheet, you probably have an idea of where in the world and what billets and what places are not going to be hard to fill. It's probably not going to be hard to get a Marine judge advocate to go to San Diego and serve at Miramar. It just probably isn't. Similarly, it's probably not going to be hard to get a Marine infantry officer to Camp Pendleton, especially with our units supporting real world operations. Again, not going to be very hard. Now, you might have issues getting that Marine to go do Sea Command 
to do chemical biological stuff up there in Fort Meade, you might have issues getting Tanisha Smith to want to go to Bahrain unaccompanied with, you know, without her five children. So if you understand the dynamics of where your critical shortfalls are going to be predictably and where you are not going to have issues, well, then you put it on the service member when you when you poll and you understand every quarter, or every year when folks are coming up with. Now, we didn't call them enlistments, but you do have contractual obligations when the government moves you. You have 24 month obligations, maybe a 36 month obligation, maybe a 48 month obligation. If you want to have, you know, a critical piece, like maybe like a submarine officer, you want to get some continuity there. You build that into the contract you make with the service member prior to them. PCSing. And one of the things we talked about is, you know, in the civilian world, if they need to fill a critical shortfall, if they need to send a, a prosecutor out to Guam, if they want to send somebody overseas to be a liaison officer in Japan, there's a compensation package. Well, why doesn't the military do the same thing? We used to do reenlistment bonuses, or we still do, but in the hypothetical, like Tanisha was talking about, we didn't talk about constraints, we talked about the universe. So Hypothetically speaking, if you don't have reenlistment bonuses because you do not have reenlistments, well, now you just have service member compensation packages. Okay, I do not need to give a compensation package to fill this void here in San Diego because everybody wants to go there. But we have a deployment happening for this Marine unit in Camp Lejeune. I can't get anybody to want to go to the low country of North Carolina. I'm going to give this service member with this skill set whatever it is, 0311 infantryman, I'm going to give him or her a $20,000 upfront one-time payment to move. So when that service member moves, they have cash in their pocket that, again, one of the things that we thought is if you're retaining the right people and you know who those people are, they're going to take that $20,000 and they're not going to Vegas with it. No, they're going to be like, you know what? Have that dinner time conversation with their spouse and go, we're going somewhere we don't want to necessarily be, but the opportunity is right. We accepted this $20,000 bonus and we're going to use that to buy a house or we're going right. to send our kids to private school because the school system there isn't good. Or we're going to do any number of these things that, again, go back to career flexibility and ownership in their career. So. Again, it might seem like this is great. No, I, I, we're we're, we're running out of time. No, no, no. It's a great conversation, and, and those are those are really terrific points. We got to make sure that when we publish the proceedings article, that that part of your presentation that only got, as you mentioned, about fifteen seconds of the CNO's time, that we 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 um, you know fully flesh that out in the in the. Uh, in the article. Uh, Tanisha, I'm going to give last word to you, just 30 seconds if you want to wrap up any saved rounds and then um, and then we got to go. Um, I, you know, I just, I'm grateful for this opportunity and I hope that um, in here in the future that when we're trying to uh, attract, uh, recruit and retain that some of these ideas, even if they aren't the major scope of what we, we, what we came up with for talent management, or force design that that some of these things can be put in place so that we can build a quality force um, and not just based off of quantity because we can get anybody to do anything but we want the best of the best so that we can continue to follow within the service service chiefs efforts and what they're trying to accomplish in each service um, and I know CNO has you know big plans and 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 having um strong war fighters, right? Um, and, and, and competent leaders is, is major points that, that he brings up in his um, strategic um, design, his force design. So I just look forward to, um, you know, moving forward and, and being uh, a, a good example for those that are out there now so we can continue to uh, build an excellent force. And I, I'm very thankful for the uh, USNI and, and Chris and Steven. Thank you. It was so great working with you both. Well, thanks. Uh, so unfortunately, we're out of time. I think this conversation could go on quite a bit longer. Uh, we've been highlighting the DARE 2023 workshop, which is uh, generously supported by USAA every year. So we want to thank our sponsor, USAA, who makes it possible uh, to put on that, um, that workshop and to bring the members together and to, uh, to, to provide hotel rooms for you all and for space there at the convention center and food and all the kinds of things that, uh, that support 
this kind of uh, you know design thinking workshop for two and a half, three days. So thanks to USA for that. And Tanisha and Chris and Steve, thanks for all you did uh, and giving your time to the uh, to the workshop and coming up with the ideas that you uh, were able to present to CNO. Thank all right. you. Well, that wraps up another episode of the Proceedings Podcast. Until next week, remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute. We'll catch you again next week.